on this computer. Okay. Hello, welcome back to Organic Chemistry, Introduction to Organic Chemistry 2330. We're gonna continue on with our chapter. Um, and we are just started chapter five. Now chapter five is one of those things where we start actually doing real chemistry. Remember the only thing that alkanes did was burn and we wanted to, we show that we are gonna do a lot of different types of reactions with those alkenes and alkynes. We're gonna add across that double bond. So we started to think about how to figure out what's happening in a reaction. And so we're gonna learn a thing about reaction mechanisms today. But last time we learned about reaction diagrams and reaction diagram really helps us understand what's happening in the reaction mechanism. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And can everybody see my screen? I just moved it, sometimes it disappears. Okay, I'm gonna put the, uh, the gallery view up over here. And I have, um, the chat says all good. Okay, so the key points about this energy diagram are things we are, have been defined already. Things like transition state one and transition state two. And transition state is that thing that happens, you know, to go from the bond you already had to making the new bond to form your new compound. So that's that state where one bond's breaking, one bond's forming, okay? Now, if a bond breaks and forms a different compound, sometimes we call that an intermediate. And those tend to be very reactive. And then we have to go through another transition state to get to our final products. And we have to have energy to get to that transition state. It's not a natural place for the molecule to be. So we have to apply energy to the system to do it. And those are our activation energies. If we do not have enough energy in the reaction, it will not go. And if this action activation energy is really, really high, uh, we call that tends to slow the reaction down. If the act, um, act, activation energy is really low, it tends to speed the reaction up. The other thing we learned about was whether the compound, whether the reaction was exothermic or endothermic. If there is a release of heat going from an energy and decreasing the total amount of energy stored in the molecule, we release heat and that's exothermic. If our product ends up having more potential energy than our starting materials, then it absorbed heat and we call that endothermic, okay? Now, the last thing we learned was that the slowest step in the reaction mechanism or the highest activation energy is typically the rate determining step. You cannot proceed with the reaction until that step has occurred. So that covers all of our definitions of heats of reactions, activation energy, transition state, and reaction intermediate and rate determining step. Now we're gonna go ahead and talk about the idea of how we can use these energy diagrams to understand what's happening step-by-step step in a reaction. And understanding what happening step-by-step step in a reaction is what we call the reaction mechanism. And I hear everybody going, oh, reaction mechanism, no. This is the place to figure out what's happening and what, what order in which it occurs, okay? So we're gonna find out which bonds are breaking and which bonds are being formed new. We're gonna know the order and relative rate of each of these steps, and that can be demonstrated with the reaction diagram. If the reaction takes place into solution, we're actually gonna to have to pay attention to that because sometimes so the solvent can control the reaction, make it easier or harder to progress. And there's also an opportunity to have a, a material known as a catalyst. And that what that'll do is that can lower the activation energy, making the reaction run more efficiently and, and more completely and faster. And then the entire, ener the entire system of, uh, has, is basically the ebb and flow of energy. So we're looking for the energy going from the beginning to the end. A reaction mechanism is not a list of ingredients or the experimental conditions for the transformation. It's what happens when you pour everything into the flask and see it change. Okay. Now, I'm going to tell you that in, in our experience, there are only five different things that can happen during a reaction mechanism. And I want you to be able to recognize all five of those different things in all the different 
uh, reactions we're going to do from now on. Okay, so we're only looking for those five things. So it's not a, a, a terrible, horrible task. It's pattern recognition. You're looking for these five things to happen in your reaction mechanism. Okay. So the way we know that these reaction mechanisms are happening is we design specific experiments to reveal certain details. So like we'll do it really concentrated and really dilute. What, what changed? We'll do it in one solvent and another. What changed? And by doing those experiments, we can get to an idea of what kind of happens. Then we promote, propose one or more uh, sets of reactions that might account for the overall chemical transformation. So we can actually just do the first part, the first activation energy without doing that and probe those different things. The mechanism becomes established when it is consistent with each and every experiment planned. So if uh, my research group uh, tests it five different ways and your research group tests five different ways and all the data is uh, coherent and all agrees with that, we can consider it an established mechanism. This doesn't mean that any proposed mechanism is correct, but it seems to be the best explanation at the time with the, react with the evidence we have right now. And so when we do these reaction mechanisms, we use a lot of curved arrows to show where the electrons are moving. We're gonna break a bond and move those electrons to form a new one. So we're gonna see lots of arrows of things moving around. We're gonna see them um, being made and being broken. And so, we're gonna look at those next few things and look for those patterns that we'll see in almost all these, in all of these mechanisms. Okay. So one of the reasons we do this is it just kind of helps us understand what's happening. Okay. And by building a kind of a set of rules that said this reaction is gonna follow this set of rules and have it react time and time again in that way, it makes it really good that it's kind of uh, intellectually satisfying that it, we've come up with the, the rules that these chemicals are going to follow. Not because we told them to, because they will, that they just do. And then once we understand it, we can actually change out the materials and we can get new chemicals, new information, new understandings of different things like, okay, I ran this on 50 different alcohols and I ran this one alcohol and it didn't work. Why didn't it work? There must be something different about this that I didn't account for. And so that's why we do all this stuff. Okay, so I told you there's five patterns we're gonna look for. The first pattern we're gonna look for is called add a proton, okay? So in this, we're going to be using our substrate as a base, and it's going to abstract a proton from something else. So that's something that can happen. So in the case down here, Okay, now notice we have all these arrows moving around. Okay, those arrows are showing where those electrons are going. And we, so we're gonna have the lone pair of electrons from the nitrogen reach out and start forming a bond with hydrogen. And the bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen actually then breaks and leaves those electrons on the oxygen, giving us this lone pair and a negative charge on our substrate and our new species that have, uh, the proton has been transferred to. Okay, so this is especially common in anything with an acid or an acid catalyzed reaction. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna transfer a proton to make a reactive intermediate. Now, what do I mean by reactive intermediate? Okay, the acetic acid here that we started with is an acid, it, it wants to kind of donate that, that proton. But now that we have this right here, we have a charged species that charged species we can use to do additional reactions, okay? So it was necessary to get that negative charge to make it react in that way. And that's why transferring the proton was necessary to make a reactive species. Okay, so our first pattern is add a proton. Okay, so then uh, our next one might be remove a proton. Oh, remove a proton. There we go. Okay, so if add a proton is one, take away a proton is another. Okay, let me actually back up and show you why adding a proton is actually kind of good for making a bunch of different reactive species. And this one is really relevant for this chapter because this is how we do it when we do these reactions with alkenes. We're gonna go do those addition reactions with alkenes, and this is an example of that. In this case here, we have the hydronium ion as the proton donor, 
So we have this as our acid. And the pi bond, the two pi electrons of the pi bond are going to reach out and grab that hydrogen away from the acid, creating a new sigma bond. That's that new sigma bond here. And in the, in the process, it creates our neutral water molecule, but it also creates this positive charge. That positive charge is our reactive species again. Just like we made the negative charge with the acetate ion on the first one, we can make a positive charge on this, which is also a reactive species. So the, the transfer of the proton was, can generate either negative or positive charges depending on where it's being transferred to. Okay, let's see what this one was. Oh, I did that one. Okay. okay. So the important part about this add a proton for this one is this intermediate is an intermediate we're going to use a lot and it's called a carbocation. What it means is we have a carbon atom with a positive charge on it. Okay. So the reason it has that positive charge is the electrons that were shared between these are used to make the sigma bond with hydrogen, leaving an electron missing out of the outer orbital of that carbon. Therefore, it has a positive charge. Now that positively charged carbon is very reactive and we can do a number of different things with it. So, but, and we'll talk about more about carbocations in a little bit. Okay, so the next thing we can do is take a proton away, okay? To maybe make something else. And so that simple as having something with lone pairs, reach out and grab that hydrogen, leaving that sigma bond, those two electrons in that sigma bond behind on the substrate. And when we do that, so we can get back to here. So if you notice, this is an equilibrium reaction. So some of these are the take the proton away on add a proton are in equilibrium and some are not. Some are irreversible. And so we need to pay attention to those reactions. Whenever they have this double arrow right here, that means they're, they're in equilibrium. If they have a single arrow, it means they are not in equilibrium. All right, I gotta let somebody in. There we go, oops, there we go. Okay, so we have add a proton and take a proton away. Well, what does take a proton away do for us? It gives us either a species that is uh, positive now that we've added our proton or a species that is negative so that it is a more reactive intermediate. The third pattern is gonna be what we call the reaction of an electrophile and a nucleophile. So let me define that. What I also want to do is I want to draw your attention to the fact that an electrophile is a Lewis acid, okay? So Lewis acid, okay? Meaning it accepts electrons to form a new covalent bond. So think things that have positive charge or, or a poor electron density around them. Boron can accept the positively charged carbon here. That is an electrophile. It's looking for electrons. De by definition, electrophile means attracted to negative charge or attracted to electrons. So think of things that are positively charged or have are, are ready to accept those electrons. Lewis acid. A hydrogen is an electrophile. It is ready to accept electrons. On the opposite of that, we have what's called nucleophile. It's looking for positive charges. What, this, what you should look for in that is everything we saw in a Lewis base. Lone pairs and negative charge. Lone pairs and negative charge tell us we have electrons available to be donated to give us our new covalent bond, okay? So in this case here, we have a carbon that is positive. And remember, we got that carbon positive because we added a proton to a double bond in step pattern number one. So that's how we can get to that charged carbon. And then we have a halogen here. This one just happens to have a whole four different lone pairs to donate to make a new sigma bond. And when these electrons reach out and add to that, we get our new sigma bond. Notice the charge goes away. We had a positively charged carbon, a negatively charged chloride, and the charge goes away forming a neutral species. Okay, so the key here is electrophile, wants to accept electrons to form a new bond, Lewis acid, Lewis acid, Lewis acid, Lewis acid. And the nucleophile is looking for a positive charge to share its electrons with Lewis base, Lewis base, Lewis base, 
and they form covalent bonds. Okay, so we have add a proton, take a proton away, and react between an electrophile and a nucleophile, or an acid and a base. Okay. So the fourth thing that can happen in a mechanism is you can have a rearrangement. Okay, now I'm going to talk a little bit more about this later, but the idea is that certain things like carbocations in particular are looking to form a more stable conformation of itself. And it turns out carbocations are more stable when they are tertiary or have three other carbons bonded to them than when they're secondary or two other carbons bonded to them. And so they will take an opportunity to move a hydrogen from one carbon to the next to generate the more stable thing. So we're actually breaking a sigma bond and moving an atom over. We can move a hydrogen or a methyl group to make the more stable system. So if we look at this one right here, this right here has one, two, three. This is a tertiary carbon. And we only have two uh, other carbons bound to this. So we have a secondary carbocation, okay? So by moving this hydrogen to the secondary carbocation, we can actually get to a tertiary carbocation. Three different carbons bonded to that, it's tertiary. Tertiaries are more stable. That's the driving force for this bond rearrangement. So we have add a proton, take a proton away, act as an acid base, nucleophile, electrophile, rearrangement, okay? The last one does happen quite a lot. And you might think, well, okay, can't you just break a bond and form two ions or a stable molecule? Yes, that is our number five pattern there. We can actually just add enough heat to the system that we can take this polar bond right here between the bromine and the carbon, because the bromine is very uh, uh, nucleophilic, I'm sorry, is very, has a high electron affinity and the carbon doesn't. So it can just with enough energy break off to form a stable anion and that stable carbocation, that tertiary carbocation. So this is a pattern we'll see also in this system. Okay, so we understand the five things we're looking for in our reaction mechanisms. You're only gonna see these five things. Nothing crazy is gonna happen. You know, atoms aren't gonna disappear. Yes, there's a hand raise. Um, so of all the carbons, the tertiary is the most stable, like period? Of the carbocations. Okay. Yeah, if there's a positive charge on carbon, the tertiary is the most stable. If there's a negative charge, we'll, we'll talk about that when we come to it. Okay, so let's kind of use those five, those five things that we can see, and let's look at the adding of things across that double bond. So what we're gonna look for is electrophilic, meaning something looking for electrons, and that pi cloud is the thing that they're looking for. Those pi electrons are above and below the plane, so they're sticking out in space. So they're easy to react with. So we're looking at that electrophilic addition to alkenes. So that means that we have to have those electrons reach out and grab something at the beginning of the mechanism. Hmm. So we should start seeing that pattern maybe. Now in the case of this first one, the hy hydrogen halides or the HCl, HBr, and HI, the idea is we have these electrons are gonna reach out and grab that hydrogen. And then somehow this bromine is gonna end up back on the compound to form a hydrogen on one carbon and a bromine on the other, or the hydrogen on one carbon and the halide on the other. And there's gonna be a specific pattern which they add. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. The other way we can do that, that same thing is transfer a proton first by having water add across it. So we're gonna have hydrogen add across the one side and then the remaining OH is gonna end up on the other carbon, okay? So we're seeing that pattern of add a hydrogen. Okay. When we have these uh, halogens, we can actually add chlorine or bromine as their diatomic cells. We can add them across, but if we have two of them, what we end up with is one on each of the carbons and it's still an electrophilic addition. Okay. So let's talk about the mechanism associated with these hydrogen halides and how it's carried out. Okay, if we carry this out in the pure reagent or in a polar solvent such as 
acetic acid, what we're gonna see is the chlorine is going to be attached to one of the carbons more often than the other, okay? In the case of ethylene, we really can't tell the difference between those two, but what's gonna happen is the hydrogen's gonna be on one carbon, no. Let me do this. The hydrogen is gonna end up on one of the carbons. The chlorine is gonna end up on the other carbon every time. So we're basically adding across that double bond, okay? So that's an addition reaction. Okay. However, if we had other groups on these methyl groups here, we're gonna see what we call regioselectivity, okay? Regioselectivity, regio meaning location or, or region. Selectivity meaning it's gonna happen at that one place more often than not, okay? So let me pull up that and I'm gonna admit to me. Let's look at this one right here. So in this case, what do I mean by regioselectivity? Okay, so here we have a methyl group added here. So now this carbon, this two carbon, is now different than the one carbon. Okay, the two carbon has a carbon and a hydrogen bonded to it. The one carbon has two hydrogens bonded to it. Okay, so they're different. So we have different types of carbons. In the ethylene, we didn't. In this one, we do. Okay, so in that case, we have when the hydrogen chloride adds across it, the hydrogen's always going to go on that least substituted side, and the chlorine's going to end up on the more substituted side, which means we have a regioselective reaction where the hydrogen's always gonna be on one of the carbons and the chlorine is, or, or the halogen is always gonna add to the more substituted carbon. And we know this because when we run the reaction, we don't get the other isomer. If they add it in the reverse direction where the hydrogen's on the more substituted carbon, we don't get that product, okay? Now, we have a name for this rule, okay? We call it Makovnik's cost rule. And so when we add any halogenated, uh, uh, any um, HI, HBr, HCl, the, the halogenated acids, the hydrogen will always add to the carbon with a greater number of hydrogens, okay? And you might wanna say, okay, like, like goes to like. So uh, though if you have more hydrogens, the hydrogen's gonna add to there. So they think of it in, it's one of those terms, and it should be very um, easy to remember that rule. Now, the reason we have this is we can do this um, again and again and again. No matter what kind of substrate we use, we can have that same type of reaction happen time and time again. So for an example, in the case where we have no hydrogens on this carbon, we have two hydrogens on this carbon, which means the hydrogen is going to go to that carbon, giving us our iodine on that, in that middle position here, and we don't see the other isomer. In the case of even just a little methyl group, we're gonna add the hydrogen to the one with the two hydrogens on it. The chlorine's gonna go on the other compound, and we don't see the other isomer. It works with water too. When we do the water, adding water across, we're gonna add the water to the one that has the more hydrogens. Notice that there's four bonds here, so there are no hydrogens there, but there's that understood hydrogen sticking out here. So we're going to add the hydrogen to this side, which means the OH is gonna end up on the other carbon, okay? So this is the major cross of Markovnikov's rule. The hydrogen is gonna end up on the most hydrogenated side, giving us our preliminary or major product. And this doesn't happen. Notice all these are major products. There are some side products that can happen, but this is gonna be the major product and I can explain why uh, when we look at the mechanism of this reaction. Okay, so just based on the Markovnikov's rule, not understanding why or how, the way to attack these problems is you first make sure you add where your hydrogens are on just your alkene. It just has to be your alkene. And then you're going to add the halogen to the, the one carbon with the least number of hydrogens, okay? Which means on this one, the bromine's gonna end up here and the hydrogen's gonna end up on this side. 
So that's going to give us our compound of, and I'm going to draw the hydrogen we put on here as well. So do we see how to count the hydrogens on our compound and see where each component is going to end up? OK, let's do it with water. So if there's a hydrogen here, there's no hydrogen on this carbon here. And so that means that hydrogen is going to go on that side. And that means the remaining OH is going to end up on this side. So let's draw that product now, OH. And we have that hydrogen. And we had our original hydrogen locator there. Okay. So we see where, why this is, where these are going. It's easy to find it. And when we do this, even with the ring system here, the same thing happens. We end up with not changing any of the ring. We're going to add our hydrogen to this side and our OH to that side. And this last one here, we're going to pull up. Cool, we have one hydrogen to two hydrogens. So this two hydrogen side is going to take the hydrogen. So we're going to have the hydrogen here and the bromine there, giving us our compound that looks like bromine, hydrogen. And for clarity, I want to draw those two, those three hydrogens that were already on the molecule. Okay. Yes, what we're talking about is the electrophilic addition of something across a double bond. So this is always with double bonds. Okay. So let's look at the mechanism. So the mechanism is going to explain exactly why it's going to do what we do. And again, we're only going to use those five different things that can happen in the mechanism. Okay. So in our case, because we have an acid, the first thing that's going to happen is we're going to add a proton. Okay. Typically, when you see acid in a system, adding a proton is one of the first steps. Okay. So in this case, our double bond here has extra electron density. It's electron density above and below. And it has more energy in it than if it was a sigma bond, right? So it's going to act as our nucleophile. It's looking to donate those electrons to something else. And in this case, our hydrogen here is acting as our electrophile. So that is going to reach out and grab that hydrogen and generate a carbocation that is stabilized by this um, chloride ion. So notice this chloride ion is now our nucleophile because it has the negative charge. And this is now our electrophile because it's got a positive charge. Okay. So in this case here, we're going to continue to react and we're going to do that nucleophile electrophile attack. Our chloride ion, because it's got a negative charge, it is our nucleophile. It's looking for a positive charge to share those electrons with, and it finds it close by with that carbocation, giving us our new sigma bond and our final product. Okay. Now, notice that on here, we have the slow step is our rate determining step. So that probably has the higher activation energy. And this step is a fast step. It's going to have a lower activation energy on our energy diagrams. So do we see how this is adding? Now, this is nice. And it's, it doesn't matter which way it adds, because we're going to end up with the same compound no matter what. But do we see how we're using those two steps to generate our final product? Uh, step two is not all, step two is not, uh, number one, it's not slower here. Uh, it's, it's step two, it's not always slower or faster. Um, whichever the slow step is, the one is the one that's control the rate of the reaction. Okay. So whatever is, then all the other reactions are faster than that slow step. So it's not one step or the other step, it's, it, it can change. So how could you tell which was slower or faster? I'm sorry. OK, so um, when we look at our energy diagram, the slow one is going to be the one with the high activation energy. And so that is, that's how we tell. You can't tell just by looking at the reaction. OK, that's, that's what I thought you could tell by no, that. No, okay. no. <laughs> not tell by looking at the reaction. Good point. OK, so let's look at that energy diagram then, OK? 
So I said that that slow step, that first step was a slow step and it must have a much higher activation energy than the next one. And when we draw our reaction diagram, we start at, with our starting materials at one level and then we start adding heat and we have to add enough heat to get enough of the molecules to get to our transition state here. In that transition state, the double bond electrons are coming out to bond with the hydrogen. And so it's breaking that pi bond and forming that new sigma bond. That's that transition state. After it forms that new bond with hydrogen, we end up with our carbocation here, okay? So our sigma bond, our new sigma bond with hydrogen is here, and we have this positive charge on carbon. Now that's our reactive intermediate, okay? It's got a positive charge. It's now an electrophile. It wants to react to form a sigma bond. So look how small this energy barrier is compared to this energy barrier. That means the first activation energy was much bigger than the second activation energy. Therefore, they react faster. And that's making this the slow step because it took more time to make the intermediate than it does for the intermediate to react and make products. Okay. So what happens here is the transition state is the chloride ion is coming up to the, the, car, the carbocation and is starting to donate its electrons to there to form that sigma bond. That's happening at this transition state. And then the bond forms and we end up finding our, for, our final product that is nice and neutral and turns out gives off heat in the reaction and is exothermic. Okay, so we just had our two different patterns and we explained the energies of how it worked on the energy diagram. Questions on that? Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the nature of that carbocation. Okay, that carbocation turns out to be sp2 hybridized. Oh no. Where did it go? Wow, that just really went. Okay, there we go. Turns out the carbocation is sp2 hybridized. Okay, so that means it has three equal orbitals and it has an unoccupied p. Okay, which means the three things it's attached to are trigonal planar and the pi orbital is empty. There's no electron in it. Okay, let's think about that. In our sigma, in our, in our pi bond, we had two pi bonds and they each had electrons in them and they were sharing those electrons to make that pi bond. Well, both of those electrons got taken away by the other carbon to make the new sigma bond. That's leaving that vacant p orbital, okay? So this structure of there is actually telling us something interesting about the system and the fact that this is a, a trigonal planar structure and we have this empty orbital, which means it can be attacked from either side to make that new sigma bond. Okay. So, because it is that way, it is an electrophile. Because it has that empty orbital, it really wants an electron, and therefore it is also a Lewis acid and will accept any electron pair that comes nearby that's willing to share with it. So that idea that we have this empty orbital ready to accept electrons is the nature of the carbocation. Now let's talk about stability. I mentioned that carb, one of our patterns was rearrangement. And I said specifically carbocations will rearrange to become more stable. Okay, so let's just look at that series. Uh, we have this methyl cation, which is where we take a cation with methane. Now that's the least stable of the set and rarely forms. This one is the ethyl cation. It's really hard to form. But now here we have our, our isopropyl cation, meaning we have our cation and we have two carbons, okay, one, two carbons attached to it, and they have to be doing something to help stabilize that. And in this case here, we have our more stable one, our most stable one, which has three carbons on it. So those carbon-carbon bonds have to be doing something to help stabilize our system. So 
tertiary carbocations are most stable. Secondary carbocations are a little less stable, but still form really well. Primary carbocations are very unstable and very hard to make. And methyl ones are very hard to make in solution. You can make them in like with lasers and vacuum and all that stuff, but you rarely ever see it. So most of the time we're generally talking about secondary and tertiary carbocations. Okay, so why? Why are they stable? Well, it turns out once you have that carbon in the middle having a formal charge of plus one, it is then now able to pull electron density in from the neighboring carbon atoms, okay? And so this electron withdrawing effect helps pull those electrons through the sigma bonds to help stabilize that positive charge. Now, because that uh, positive charge is now uh, um, is not delocalized over there, it has to only pull in from those uh, three donators and that helps stabilize that charge. So the more things you have donating to it, the more stable it is. So what does that look like? Okay. So in the case of our methyl cation here, the electronegativity of our Hydrogens is just a little bit less than that of the carbon, and therefore they can only donate some of their electron density to the carbocation, giving it a, a net full charge of about 0.6. Okay. So there's not really much those hydrogens can do to help stabilize that positive charge. However, once we go to the tertiary one, it can pull a significant amount of electron density from each of these right here to get it to be less positive. Now notice here, the center of this is really, really blue and really localized here. Notice the, the blue is a lot smaller and, and is more localized. Okay. So, tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations. And therefore we're gonna see that kind of rearranged sometimes. But how does that apply to Markovnikov's role? Okay. Well, when we did that before, we knew the first step was the electrophile, the alkene, reaching out and grabbing that hydrogen, the Lewis acid. When it did so, it created a positive charge. Okay. So if we just had it reach out from the middle and put that hydrogen on the middle carbon here, that puts the positive charge on the end carbon. And that would be a primary carbocation, and that would yield this product here, okay? So that's just if the uh, double bond was formed with the central carbon or the more substituted carbon of the alkene, okay? What if instead the outer carbon was the one that the hydrogen formed the sigma bond with? If it does, that would generate our secondary carbocation, which is more stable and more common, and therefore it would give us our product where the chlorine would be ending up on the secondary carbon, okay? Because that was the carbocation, that's the electrophile looking for that chloride ion. And in fact, that's what we see as the most formed product. So Markovnikov's rule is all about the stability of the carbocation formed. It doesn't want to form the primary carbocation, so it will not form this product. It can form a secondary carbocation, so it will form this product as our major. Okay, do we understand that? So the carbocation is the whole reason Markovnikov's rule works. Okay. All right. So I'm gonna, sorry, I gotta, Take a drink of green tea before I cough. Okay, thank you, excuse me. Okay, so let's apply that to that addition of water across that alkene as well. Why does the OH always end up on that more substituted carbon? The same reason, okay? So if we took this right here and we had the hydrogen add to the outermost carbon, we're going to end up with the alcohol on the more substituted carbon, okay? And so this is going to be our primary um, product of the reaction. 
Now, if we do it here, we're going to do that exact same thing. We're going to add the hydrogen to the more to the the carbon with more hydrogens, and we're going to end up with our OH on that more substituted carbon. So, what does that mean? That means in the intermediate, we must be forming carbocations. So, let's look at that stepwise. Okay. So, the first thing we do when we have the uh, propene, three carbons with an alkene in it, propene, it acts as a nucleophile to reach out and grab an acidic proton on the hydronium ion, in this case, as our first step. Okay. When we do that, it's going to form a carbocation. So we have the choice of forming a primary carbocation here or a secondary carbocation here. Which one is it going to form? It's always going to form the secondary carbocation because it's more stable. Okay, once we do that, we now have our new electrophile and we have a species with lone pairs on it, which is our new Lewis base or our new nucleophile. So the second step of the reaction is probably going to be a nucleophile and an electrophile reacting to form a sigma bond. Okay. So that's what happens. The electrons from the lone pair on water, neutral water, will reach out and combine, making a new sigma bond. This is those electrons right there. They're making that new sigma bond with oxygen. And we're generating a charged species because we had a neutral species, we had a positive charge, we still have a charged species. And when we have a positive charge on oxygen, we call that the oxonium ion. So we're done, right? Well, now we have a charged species and the product was just an alcohol. So we have to apply one of those possible things to happen in a mechanism to get to that stage. And so what we do is we actually use neutral, another neutral water molecule here is gonna come and act as our base and take away that proton, that acidic proton from here kicking those electrons in. So our oxygen now has two lone pairs like it's supposed to. And we've regenerated our hydronium ion, okay? So in this case, when we regenerate our hydronium ion, we can call it a catalyst because a catalyst is a material you don't need very much of that in lowers the activation energy that gets us to products. So we have regenerated our catalyst and we have our final product as a neutral molecule. Okay, so that first step that add the proton to form the more stable carbocation is why they add that way every time. Okay, so okay, so account for the fact that acid catalyzed hydration of alkenes can be used to prepare both secondary and tertiary alcohols, but not primary alcohols. Um, are all these steps written out individually? You mean in a reaction mechanism? Yes. When we actually are writing the mechanism of a reaction, you write out each step individually. Or you can write them all in a, in a, in a continuous line, but, but you have to show each and every step. Okay. so. We can make secondary and tertiary alcohols, but we can't make the primary alcohol. And it comes down to the fact of carbocation stability. You are never going to form your primary carbocation. The only way to get to this primary alcohol is to have that primary carbocation react with water. So that's why we'll never see a primary alcohol made by the addition of water across an alkene. Doesn't mean we can't make primary alcohols. It means we have to do something else to do it. And we have a, we have a reagent for that. We're gonna talk about that later. Okay, so we understand carbocation, carbocation stability. Okay, so we're gonna take one of these and we're gonna kind of go backwards. We're gonna figure out where the double bond was to make these alcohols, okay? So I'm gonna do this one, I'm gonna do A and D, and you can go back and do C and B on yourself, on your own and see if you can do it, okay? So if we have this, we have a couple different options here, um, but we wanna make sure that this OH is our major product, which means that we have to break that bond, and then we have to find somewhere to take a hydrogen. 
Okay, so what that means is in the case of there, we can take a hydrogen from here or here or here to make that product. So that means we can have a variety of different alkenes that can make that alcohol. So if we take this one, let me do them in different colors. We have a blue hydrogen, we have a red hydrogen, and we have a green hydrogen here. If we take that blue hydrogen off, that means we're gonna end up with our double bond here. And so our material is gonna look like that. And again, if we go backwards, we're gonna add a hydrogen to the outside here. We're gonna add the OH here. So that's how we know we did it correctly. Okay. So do we see how we're going backwards in that, figuring out what the starting material would have been with our product? So now let's do the red one right here. So if we take the red one off, that means we're gonna have a double bond here, which is gonna look very similar. It's gonna look like that. So that's basically the same compound. So it would, it would make the same product no matter what. Now let's do the green one. If we have that hydrogen here, that means our double bond had to be in here, but not out here because the OH would have ended up on this carbon. So the fact is the, the double bond had to be in between where the hydrogen was removed and the OH was added. So that's turning it into a different material altogether, gives you here. So all three of these alkenes will give this product in acid catalyzed hydration. Okay. Do we see why? Okay. All right. So well, all you all you did was take a hydrogen away at a different spot and add the double bond, correct? Right. So okay. when, when to make the double bond, we take a hydrogen away from a carbon one over from where the alcohol was. So we're going to take the OH and the hydrogen off, which is water. And that makes the double bond go in between those two groups. Okay? Okay. So we can do that thing here too. We have the possibility of a hydrogen here. We have the possibility of a hydrogen here. We have the possibility of a hydrogen here that can be done to make those. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna do one of those. Let me erase all of those. And I'm gonna show, actually, I'm gonna do three of these. There's a red one, uh, there's a blue one, and there's a green one right here. So if we do the red one, we're gonna end up with our double bond right here. So we're gonna have dum, 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 right here. So we've taken off this hydrogen, we're gonna put those electrons back, we leave that there giving us our double bond there. So that would be the red compound. Let's do that for the blue. We're gonna take these electrons, kick those in, kick this out. So that means our double bond is gonna be way over here. And then if we do it for our green one, we can do that same one too. These electrons kick in, this electrons kick out with the OH, giving us a different material. Right there. So any of these three compounds can be used to make this alcohol using that acid catalyzed hydration. Okay, don't forget to go back and try, see how many different uh, products you can make that, uh, how many different starting materials you can make with that reagent. How do you make the double bond again? Like where does the extra pair come from? Okay, let's, yeah, that's a great question. Okay, let me simplify it here and let me draw a hydrogen here. Okay, so we're doing the reverse reaction of what we're doing, the addition wise, which means these electrons that were bonded to the hydrogen are the ones that were the double bond. So if we kick those in to give us our double bond, that means we have to kick out the electrons making that sigma bond between the oxygen and the carbon. Okay, that's how you find your double bond. <coughs> Good. And where did those, those, uh kicked out electrons go? They are on the oxygen as either a lone pair or as a, a charge or other species. So would it be plus um, the hydroxyl group or? Well, because we're okay. leaving, the, hyd the hydrogen's leaving as a plus charge, the hydroxyl's leaving as a minus charge. And mm. so really these are going to 
react with each other to form water. So it'd be plus water. So it'd be neutral water. I meant in the reaction side. Oh yeah, in the reaction in the reaction side, we, we would be adding water across that double bond. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. One one more clarification. So the pictures that we drew, so that plus water would give you what we have over here at the A B C D, right? Like correct. that's the reaction, correct? Exactly right. So it's basically your first step is going to be. That right there, we're going to add that water across the alkene to get to that step. So yes, all we've done is that add that water across the double bond. Okay, so the same mechanism is used for the uh, um, the acids HCl, HBr, and HI, as is used in this hydration. The only difference is one's going to have an OH on there at the most substitute carbon. And the other ones are going to have a halogen at the most. Okay. All right. So, are we confident about that um, that reaction with this addition of acids and water across a double bond? Because now we're going to switch gears a little bit and go to a slightly different mechanism, but we're going to do uh, the addition of halogens across a double bond. Okay. I have a question. Yes. The previous slide, how would a question be formed around that? On the previous slide? Okay, e uh, easy things like um, uh, given, you know, it's going to be like if I added acid and water to this, what, are the, what would the products be? And then you'd have to know, you'd have to be able to say plus acid. What, what would the addition product of water, uh, acidic water on across an alkene be? So you'd have to, to go from the structural formula to be able to figure out the, the a, a chemical formula and the answer? Well, no, you can, you, would, you can use this drawing right here and just know that, okay, I'm going to add my hydrogen on one side of this bond, the OH on the other side of the bond. And by using my carbon cost rule, you know exactly which way to do it. Does that make sense? Where would that at the acid go that you said, or um, you're adding water and an acid? Remember, we regenerate our acid in the last step of the mechanism. So it actually is a cap, we regenerate it here in the last step of the mechanism when we take away a proton. So the acid okay. just, we can add just a drop of acid and make the reaction go. Okay. So um, given an alkene, water and acid, what's the alcohol produced? That's the kind of questions you should be ready to answer. Okay, so now let's go to halogens. Halogen's a little bit different and, um, okay, no, that's, yeah, let's skip that one. There's, there's a reason I'm skipping that one, but okay. So let's talk about just adding chlorine two or bromine two across a double bond. The first thing we have to do is we have to use an inert solvent. So sometimes people look at this and say, oh, it's a reactant. No, it's just a solvent, but it doesn't react with the halogen because it already has a couple halogens on it. Okay, so the, that's the first thing you have to do. It has to be something that doesn't react with bromine or chlorine. And bromine and chlorine are very reactive, so that list of, of solvents is very, very short. This just happens to be one of them. It's called dichloromethane or methylene chloride. Okay. So in the nature of this, we know we're going to add bromine across that double bond, so what we're going to end up with is one bromine on each carbon of that double bond, giving us a totally all, you know, sp3 hybridized carbons on both sides. Okay. So how do we get there? Okay. Well, it turns out that the addition of chlorine and bromine is also stereoselective. I said before with the other two reactions, it was regioselective, right? Meaning it, you picked which carbon the product was going to be on. Since we're adding one to each side, this is not regioselective. However, this is stereoselective, meaning that once one 
carbon, one bromine or chlorine adds to the reaction, there's a specific location for the other one to come in. And that's all because of its mechanism. Okay. So this is a new term, stereoselective, meaning it, it uh, creates it only in one way. Okay. And in this case, if we do it to like a cyclohexene right here, we always get the trans product. Okay. Uh, so we call that anti. And I'll explain that why. And it's called anti because the bromine has to come in from the opposite side of the molecule from where the other bromine started. So let's dig into that in a little more detail. Right here. So this is stereoselective reaction. Okay. So just like in the other reactions, we have steps. Our first step is a nucleophilic electrophilic attack. Now, in this case, our double bond is again our nucleophile. And when it does that, it comes and starts to form a bond with bromine right here. When it's doing that, it's actually breaking the bond with the other bromine. Okay. So it has electrons reach out from the double bond to create that. Once that happens, the carbocation is formed on one of the carbons, and then it immediately reacts with the bromine to give you this three-membered ring. And we call that three-membered bridged thing a bromonium ion. Okay. And we have, of course, the this one took its electrons and turned it into the bromine bromide ion or the bromine negative. So that's our first thing that happens. And this happens so quickly, we never really see it change or rearrange. So we go from our nucleophile to getting our bridged bromonium cat. So we have a plus charge on this side, we have a minus charge on this side. So, oh, great, the bromine's gonna come in and attack this bromine. Well, it could, but if it did, you just generate bromine and the alkene again. So that's not probably what's going to happen if we're going to get products. So what can happen? Okay. Well, now we have our positively charged thing is now our electrophile, right? Because it wants electrons. And our negatively charged thing is our nucleophile. It's looking for a positive charge. But if it attacked at the top, that would not yield products. Okay. So what if it attacked on the bottom and made a new sigma bond with the carbon? When it does that, it can kick those electrons up to give a neutral bromine. So we're going to do that nucleophile and electrophilic attack again. But because the top of the molecule here is blocked out with this bromine, that bromide has to come in from the exact bottom. And when it does that, and when it ring opens, we end up getting these two groups are going to be up, these two groups are going to be down, and these bromines are going to be anti to each other. And if we look at a Newman projection of this exact compound uh, from this direction here, we have our methyl group, methyl group, and bromine on our carbon on this side. And then we have our methyl group, methyl group, and bromine for our carbon on the other side, right here. So this is our bromine. Okay, so do we see that those, those two bromines are, are completely opposite each other? And that's because it has to be, when this bromine comes in, it's going to be completely opposite of this. That leads to the stereoselectivity of the reaction, okay? They have a specific location in space. They are not random. They are going to be exactly opposite each other. OK. So what we do sometimes is we do these reactions on cyclohexene because it's easier to tell what the stereochemistry was. OK. So if we're going to do bromine addition across this uh, double bond, what we should see is that we should have one of the bromines react on the top and then the other bromine come out from the other. So they have to be opposite each other when we add our hydrogen to the system. So see how in this configuration they're opposite each other? However, they're both axial, and that's not the most stable because those are big. So it's going to rearrange to give us these. Now notice these are still opposite each other because when we add our axial hydrogens here, 
This hydrogen's on the top and this bromine's on the top. This bromine and this hydrogen are on the top. This hydrogen and this bromine are on the bottom. So they're still in that trans configuration, okay? That um, they're on opposite sides. So that's why we use cyclohexene for that probe because it's really easy to tell the difference between the two. Okay, so do we understand why it's going adding opposite each other? Because of, it's blocking the top with that three-membered that uh, three -membered ring. Okay. All right, uh, it's 12 o'clock. Go ahead and do the last part stretch. I'm gonna take a little sip of green tea here. Okay, we've got 20 minutes to power through until we're done. So let's continue on looking at this mechanism. Okay, now one of the things that happens when we have carbocations is that they can rearrange and they can rearrange to form the more a stable carbocation before they do that second reaction. So we can actually have mixtures of isomers because of this rearrangement. Now in this rearrangement, we're actually breaking a sigma bond either between a hydrogen or a methyl group and moving it one carbon over to generate that more stable carbocation. So if we can imagine that in this stage here, we're not gonna form the carbocation here, but we are gonna form a secondary carbocation here. So if that secondary carbocation reacted with the product, we would end up with that chlorine on that secondary carbon. However, what turns out is the major product is the chlorine over here. And notice this methyl group has moved from the first, from that first carbon over to the carbon here. So that methyl group had to move from here to here to give us our, our intermediate there. Why? Well, this is a secondary, uh, would it have been formed from a secondary carbocation? this would have been a tertiary carbocation. So we've actually got the more stable, a tertiary carbocation by moving either a methyl group or hydrogen over one slot. And we call that the methyl or hydride shift. Okay. All right. So the important thing about this hydride or methyl shift is it only goes one carbon over, okay? So they're called a one, two shift. We're gonna only shift one carbon over. You're not gonna rearrange the carbocation more than once. It's gonna go from secondary to tertiary and stop, okay? So that way we can know that it's gonna go either one direction or the other, but the intermediate is always the most stable carbocation possible. So let's think about the mechanism there. So the first step is going to be add a proton. And when we add the proton, we know we don't want to form the primary uh, carbocation, so we end up forming the secondary carbocation, okay? And now we get to use our number four um, type of thing that happened in the mechanism, rearrangement of a bond. Okay. So in this case here, it takes both electrons from that sigma bond between this methyl group and moves them over to where that positive charge is. In the process, because it's taking both electrons of that methyl group over, we generate our carbocation now on a tertiary center. And, mute, there we go. So we actually have changed from having that chloride appear on our secondary carbon to end up being attacked here. So now that this is our intermediate after it's rearranged, our last step is going to be the reacting of that carbocation electrophile with the anion of the nucleophile to give us our tertiary alkyl chloride. Okay, questions? So in this, it's always a carbocation and the carbocation can move a methyl or a hydrogen only. It will not move any larger group. And it much, much prefers to move a hydrogen if at all possible. So if you had a choice between moving a methyl and a hydrogen to get to your tertiary carbocation, 
the hydrogen will move. Okay. So these rearrangements happen a lot in acid catalyzed systems because it always wants to stop, hang around as that carbocation, rearrange to form the more stable carbocation. So we see this rearrangement happen in alcohols as well. So I showed it in the alkyl halides. It also happens in the acid halides and it happens in the alcohols as well. All right. Okay, so let's play with that right here. There's another kind of rule in um, carbocation rearrangement that it also likes to take small rings and make them bigger. So let's go ahead and try to figure out our mechanism for converting this compound right here with HBr to this compound right here. Okay. So I'm gonna draw that right up here. We're gonna say the first thing that's gonna happen is we're gonna add a hydrogen right here, which gives us a carbocation right here, okay? So, but there's no methyl group there, okay? But there's that sigma bond here, and it's gonna open up a ring to make it a bigger ring if we take these electrons, move them here, and move the carbocation to that space, okay? So when it does that, we now have a secondary carbocation with that methyl shift. So that's probably not gonna work very well. So it would actually end up being, now that we have our new species here with a carbocation here, we can do a hydride shift to give us our carbocation back to here. And that will give us our product. It doesn't. It shouldn't rearrange more than once. Let me see, there's gotta be a better way to do it. Uh, see, hydride shift here. Hmm. Yeah, it's going from a secondary carbocation to a secondary carbocation to a tertiary carbocation to give us this product here. Yes, that's right. Okay, so that's also one of those uh, things about, notice the product is very different than the starting material and it has everything to do with trying to find that more stable carbocation. Okay, all right. So let's talk about carbocations, okay. So we have it trigonal planar sp2 hybridized with an empty p orbital above and below the plane, okay. Because it is electron deficient, it wants to pull electron density in from things around it. So the tertiary carbocation is much sta more stable than the secondary, which is much, much more stable than the primary. So we almost always only see tertiary and uh, secondaries in our solutions. Carbocations can be stabilized by electron drawing inductive effect of positively charged things. So the oxygens are, I mean, sorry, donators like carbon and oxygen can help stabilize that charge. Methyl and primaries are so unstable, we'll hardly ever see them. Um, they can go through a one-two shift to rearrange the carbocation to make a more stable carbocation, usually observed between going from a secondary to a tertiary. All right, questions on carbocations? Um, I have a question. Yes. So uh, on the third dot there, um, the inductive effect, it causes the inductive effect because if there's more carbons, they're attracted to the carbon uh, the cation. It can pull electron density from those three carbons attached to it, making it more stable. So imagine that you, it's pulling a little bit of electron density, so it's a little less positive. If it's a little less positive, it's a little more stable. That's and why. It's attracted to the carbons because they have more like free electrons to. No, no, no. It's because they're bound to it directly, right? We have a carbon here, a carbon here, and a carbon here, and our carbocation here. It's actually inductively pulling it through the sigma bonds. It's pulling some of that electron density from those sigma bonds 
to help stabilize that charge, right? Now, and carbons also have, you know, the hydrogens on them here. And so it can donate some more electron density. If you had instead a hydrogen here, the hydrogen does not have very much more electron density to give. So the hydrogen can't give it any more electron density to help stabilize that positive charge. So that's why the secondary isn't as stable as the tertiary because the, the hydrogen can't donate inductively through that bond. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, sir, thanks. So anytime you see the word inductive, that's a through bond effect, okay? Okay, so that means that carbocation intermediates undergo three types of reactions. They can rearrange to a more carbo stable carbocation by a one-two shift. They can add a nucleophile to that carbon, so have electrons come in to form a new covalent bond, or you can just lose a proton to go back to the alkene. So those are the three things that carbocations do in our reactions. Um, and so we're, we're not actually going to make alkenes just yet. We're gonna look at those addition reactions across alkenes first. Okay, we've got a few minutes left, but we're still on the reactions of the um, alkenes. Okay. So we said by acid-base catalyzed hydrolysis to form alcohols, we could only form secondary and tertiary alcohols. You never form the primary. But I said, don't worry, we have a way of forming that primary alcohol. And the way we do that is we call what, is what we do called hydroboration oxidation. So basically, instead of adding water across our double bond, we're gonna add the boron, borane, BH bond across that double bond and it does something different than the other things. And then when we have that boron on that bond, we can oxidize that boron off and give us our alcohol. So in general, this goes in the reverse of what we saw. So we call that anti-Markovnikov's hydration. Okay. So why does it work? Well, that's an important step here. The idea here is that we have our first step in the hydroboration is the reaction of the boron hydrogen bond. This boron hydrogen bond is going to add across one of these alkenes. And then as we have more than one hydrogen, it can actually do all three of those hydrogens can react to give us this intermediate compound. Now, so notice this, we have uh, the hydrogen went to these outer ones and the boron is attached here. So now by oxidizing off the boron, we can end up with our alcohols. Okay. So a key part of the borane reaction is the fact that it complexes with THF or tetrahydrofuran, which makes it more reactive, okay? So it actually just um, reacts with the oxygen there in a Lewis acid base strategy. The boron is electron negative, the oxygen is electro, uh, I'm sorry, the boron is electro positive, the oxygen is electro negative, and we get a Lewis acid complex forming. To give us this is our real true reactive species in the system. And notice we have a negative charge on boron. Important. Okay. So, before it forms that complex, it is sp3 hybridized. I'm sorry, sp2 hybridized because it only has three valence electrons and it's easier to just hybridize for the three valence electrons you have and leave that other orbital empty. And so in that case, we have an empty p orbital. So that looks a lot like a carbocation, but without a positive charge, right? Okay. So how can we use that to our advantage? Well, the cool thing is that because boron reactivity is a little bit different, we actually end up getting regioselectivity about where the hydrogen adds on that boron bond. And we also get stereoselectivity. Okay, so we had regioselectivity on the acid catalyzed hydrolysis. We had stereoselectivity on that addition of uh, 
bromine across them. In the case of hydroboration, we have both. We have stereoselectivity and regioselectivity. So in the regioselectivity, we're gonna end up adding the boron to the less substituted atom and the hydrogen to the more substituted atom. And if we think about it, it's because where, uh, where it's occurring right here. Now, I said it's also stereoselective, okay? The hydrogen and the boron add across the same side of the double bond. So that's different. We haven't done that before. So let's look at that in more detail. So the idea here is that we have our boron coming over here. And because boron is the more electropositive atom, it carries most of the positive charge. You know, the partial positive, and the hydrogen is actually more electronegative, okay? So what it does is instead of breaking that bond, they line up such that the more electronegative hydrogen is near the carbon that would have formed the carbocation. It's the more electropositive side of the alkene, the one that would have formed the carbocation. So that what it does then is now it just uh, these electrons kick up, these electrons kick down, and you formed your compound. Now, if we look at it adding the other way, the boron's adding to this one, and now we have our partially positive charge on our primary carbon. Primary carbocations are at least stable, so that is not a favored reaction. So this is a weird little reaction where we have the formation of the complex first, and then we are adding the hydrogen to the least substituted side, we're adding the boron to the more substituted side, and it has everything to do with the idea that the boron is actually acting as the acid, and the acid gets added to the least uh, substituted carbon. And the hydrogen is the one that's going to be added to the one that's the most like a carbocation. Okay? So once we have our boron on here, we just oxidize it off, and that's how we get primary alcohols. All right, we're coming right up on 1220. So I'm going to save reduction of alkenes for next time. So I'm going to go ahead and stop here. I'm going to stop sharing and stop recording. If you have questions, please stay behind. If you don't have questions, have a safe weekend and meet me back here on Tuesday. I see a raised hand.